Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the host and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have problems with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios East and West. Transmitting across the internet, this is episode 262 of Registry Matters. Good evening, fine sir. How are you? Doing awesome. Glad to be with you after, a, what did we take, one week off after a one-week vacation? That is correct. It was uh, Easter and I was out of town. And uh, next week, uh, we're going to record on a different day, is that right? Or skip? <laughs> it's not going to be this coming week because I'm, oh. I'm going to put that off to the end of the month. So maybe the last uh, weekend in April, the first weekend in May, but I've got to go to California. I thought you said it was next weekend. Well, when I looked at options it wasn't a good time to do it next weekend i see all right then well uh welcome everybody as uh you know you found us here so please make sure that you like and subscribe on youtube and give five star reviews on whatever podcast app you are using and you know my preferences for a podcast so fire up a podcast app and subscribe to it so it will automatically be downloaded on your phone you can pick up the the Patreon version. You'll get that as soon as I finish editing it, which could be late Saturday night or Sunday morning. You'll get it in your feed. Or uh, if you uh, do it the uh, shlomo way, then you'll get it uh, Tuesday morning before you would head off to work. Uh, but do me a favor, sir. Would you tell us what we're going to be doing this evening? We're going to be doing a deep dive on a case from the Rhode Island Supreme Court. And it deals with risk assessments. And we're going to be talking about the complexity and the expense of those risk assessments. And we're going to talk about the arrest of a jail staffer in Clayton County, Georgia. And we're going to have a few questions. So it should be fun. Outstanding. Well, let's uh, dive right in to a comment that came in from Stefan. It says, I heard from a connections person that Washington, that House Bill 1394 is on the governor's desk. It would keep juveniles off the public registry. It's an interesting bill. I did a little research. Now I understand a little bit about how the legislative process is done, but I had no idea how complicated it is. But when I went to this resource, I was shocked. Also, you often talk to the audience about how complicated the legislative process is. This shows it. Most Republicans voted against the bill, except for three, and most Democrats for it, except for three. And uh, I don't think I'm going to pull that link up. But uh, so wh wh where are we going from this? Well, I'm just uh, showing that what I say is not totally without merit. There is a fair amount of complexity in what goes through these legislative bodies. Theoretically, it's a great deliberative process. We want to get this stuff right, believe it or not. We want to get it right. At least I know that's been my experience in the decades I've been in the process. And there's a lot of thoughtful contemplation of language, and purpose, unintended consequences. And I just can't help myself since I didn't write this. I can point <laughs> out that, that this is the reality of the situation. You know, all of our audiences. Heavily leaning conservative, but yet the conservatives don't give us a lot of help on stuff like this. Now, this is a step in the right direction in Washington, which Washington is not that bad to begin with in terms of registration. You know, they do have they do have ways off the registry, and they do have a risk-based system, as I understand it, to begin with. But to get the juveniles off the public registry, which I think they never should have been there to begin with, that's all a positive thing. But where were the Republicans? Why weren't they voting for it? It's, it's interesting. I, uh, I was thinking about bringing this up. I don't want to hijack this. However, uh, Georgia had a uh, statewide meeting the other day and there was some guy in chat uh, while we were having the meeting that says that he's trying to reach out to us and help. Uh, but then he says something about that the government is just corrupt, 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 and nothing can be done because it's corrupt. And I was like, there's a ranking of how corrupt countries are and the United States is listed, I think in the top 20 of not corrupt nations. So if you think that we're corrupt compared to, I don't know, some middle African country, like, I mean, run by warlords and whatnot, I don't see how people say it's quote unquote corrupt. I know that money moves things, Larry, but you have 
the opportunity to meet your legislator and so forth. Like, I don't see how people just come off and say it's just corrupt, 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 and nothing works. It really pains me when I hear comments like that because I've been in the system working in it as an advocate for a long time, long before PFR issues were ever on my radar. And I've seen nothing that substantiates that. Is there corruption? Yes. There are human beings involved in government. And human beings are fallible. So, of course, there are people who succumb to temptation. But the overwhelming majority of them are there for the right reasons. They're there because they believe in contributing back to having a better state, better city, better county, whatever body they're serving in. And you may disagree with them. You may see things differently. But they're there for the right reasons. They really are. It's not, (laughs) you're not corrupt just because you vote for something that you happen to believe is good public policy. You may be, you may be mistaken, but that doesn't make you corrupt. It really doesn't. (laughs) So uh, it really pains me when I hear that. Do you think Mitch is there trying to make the right decisions? I actually do. I think that he's, (laughs) He's he's doing what he believes Kentuckians want, at least the ones he hears from, what he perceives to be right. And I think he's misguided on a lot of things. I think his uh, uh, tactic to take the Supreme Court the way he did, that was unprecedented. But he looked at it differently. His looking at it was, I'm only in this earth for a short period of time. I'm fortunate to be in this leadership position, and I'm going to try to make a difference for what I believe in. And I'm going to try to get justices on the Supreme Court that are in alignment with me and with Kentuckians and what I believe in. Did he get paid off? No. He didn't get paid to do anything. He just believed that, that it was time for a different direction on the court. You had a choice when you went in the ballot room, the ballot box in Kentucky, and you had a choice. And you reaffirmed that he did do the right thing because you people in Kentucky, you did reelect him after all this. I hear you. The other comment that I wanted to bring up, uh, but I'm, I don't want to really spend too much time. So somebody said that they uh, they made uh, X amount of money doing solo kind of work and they had to write a check to pay for their taxes. Somebody else chimed in and said something similar. And then another person who's quote unquote, a libertarian, small government kind of person, he said, I hate it that I owe money and it's a, uh, it's and it's unconstitutional that I owe this money. And I forgot how he worded it, but he's on the registry. So he is diminished for it i forgot the way he worded it It was like like, uh, too bad you weren't at the conference last year i would have introduced you to him you know i don't have a lot of respect for people who refer themselves as libertarians i know (laughs) because because we're we're all benefiting from the collective good of things that are done collectively and that includes the people who don't like paying the taxes The national defense covers you. That umbrella covers you. The national transportation, all that covers you. The education and public health system covers you so there's not diseases running rampant. The criminal justice system that keeps crime at a fairly low level covers you. All the things that we collectively contribute to, you benefit from those things. And I think that you ought to be willing to pay your fair share of the cost of those things. Your share is different depending on what you have achieved in the capitalist system. Our tax system is designed that if you earn more, you pay more. So if you earn $500,000 a year, you're going to pay more for the collective good than a person who earns $10,000 a year. I mean, you benefited more from, from, what, uh, from the things that the common good did. You benefited more. You didn't do this all yourself. All right, let's move along, sir, before we uh, end up spiraling down like a, a, a downed fighter from World War I. Uh, this is a, a letter that you received to the legal corner from uh, Narsal, and it's from Mike. And he says, hello, I read in a book something that concerned me. It suggested that if an RC, which would be a registered citizen, if a registered citizen was given a pardon to get off the registry in one state, another state may or may not accept that pardon. Does an RC still have to report to the other states or risk non-compliance because another state refuses a given pardon elsewhere? I assume petitions granted would be the same deal since the outcome is more or less the same. Right. Boy, he kind of flips that around, making that complicated to uh, follow along with. But I think you get it. I do. And I put it in there because I thought it was a great question. Yeah. 
the state gets no choice of accepting the pardon. If a, if a governor of New Mexico grants you a pardon, you're pardoned in Georgia. But the analysis in terms of registration goes a little deeper than that. So the question is, New Mexico granted you a pardon, but since registration is a civil regulatory scheme and a collateral consequence of your conviction, in order to get a pardon, I'm not aware of anyone who grants a pardon when you've not accepted responsibility and admitted that you did what you did. Okay. So as a factual matter, you did commit the sexual offense. And there are states that regardless of whether you are still convicted, the fact that you actually the facts are there that you committed the offense and you might have to register. Now, this takes us down the rabbit hole of if you're not registered in the state that you got the pardon, first of all, you might consider staying there. But yep. second of all, if you do go to a new state, I never advise anyone to present themselves because it would be reasonable for you to believe that you're done. But the answer is yes, you might end up in a state, you might encounter the police, they might run your background. They might find the pardon. They might still say that our law, I think Florida would be an example. I think Florida would still include a duty to register for a pardoned person, but I'd have to do some deeper research, and I just got this today. But you could end up being back on the registry. Stay put. If you really want to have the security that you're looking for, stay put. Right. I understand that one. Uh, all right. Uh, anything else there before we uh, head along to Rhode Island? No, but I do appreciate Michael's question. It It's very, very good because people, they don't understand a pardon doesn't even necessarily give you your firearm possession rights back. It doesn't. The, I mean, the question he's a, asking, though, is just similar to I got removed from the registry. That has nothing to do with if I go visit Florida and end up on their registry because the wording may say I have been convicted of a sexual offense. Now I'm on their registry. Yes, and even when you leave, you're still going to be on their internet website. Yes, and that means I can't get jobs and so forth. It's just the website, Larry. It's just the website. Well, I mean, I know people get angry when I say that, but that is all it is. I know. I know. I, know. <laughs> I was poking fun at those people. and We're going to get a bunch of email hate letters now. It's more than a website, Larry. <laughs> okay. So, oh, that's the wrong window that I don't want to pull up yet. All right. Um, so you want to talk about this case from Rhode Island, don't you? I do, because there are thousands of people writing me about it. <laughs> and there's only 12 people that live in Rhode Island. This comes from the Rhode Island Supreme Court, and it just came out a few days ago. The case is State versus uh, Caesar or C Cesare. Which way? How do you say that name? I'm going to decline. That's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> C E S A R E, Cesare de Credico. That is a name I have never heard of before in my life. All right. And I'm not sure. Yeah. So I, I have no idea how to pronounce that name. I think from this point on, I will simply refer to him as Mr. D. What is this case about? I've read it twice, Larry, and I wanted to know. I was sitting there at dinner, actually, and I was ignoring my family when uh, reading it, but uh, I was hoping that you might have a clue. Well, then why don't you tell us about it? But yes, I do have a clue. The petitioner is uh, Mr. D, as you said, and he appealed from a final judgment of the Superior Court that was in favor of the state of Rhode Island. The decision affirmed the determination of the Rhode Island Sex Offender Board of Review, and they had decided that Mr. D poses a level two or moderate risk of reoffending. So that's what the issue was. Before we dig too deeply into this particular case, I'd like to expand on the process in Rhode Island. I've heard you pontificate about the difference in levels across the United States, and you've spouted some mumbo jumbo about risk uh, based levels versus uh, what you refer to as the categorical approach. And I'm going to say that with lots of air quotes, categorical approach. Please, sir, tell me what the difference is. Well, I'm not sure why you would call it mumbo-jumbo, but I can't explain it. <laughs> the Adam Walsh Act, otherwise known as AWA, recommends a categorical approach, meaning that the offenses themselves are the basis for the tier level designation or assignment. On the other hand, a risk-based system considers the individual and many factors of that individual's offense and their background. Once this process is complete, he or she is notified of the level of risk they po believe that, that they pose to the community. The categorical approach, there's no analysis of any, anything like that. You did this crime, I'm looking at my list, this is a tier two. 
So that's that's how simple it is. Uh, and is that what happened in this case? Is that how this individual uh, was determined to be a level two? Uh, that is correct. It's, all right. Well, that, th then it begs the question, why don't all states do risk assessments for the PFR population instead of doing categorical? Well, well many reasons. But first, it's an expensive proposition to undertake, and it's complicated. That That's not my problem that it's complicated. What is so complicated about it to figure out like you just get some people to get into a room and go is this guy a threat is this person not a threat that, all right well what's your answer there so, well uh, it's a little more complicated than that uh, so well first we would need to determine what the goals are of the risk assessment scheme because risk assessment schemes are done for a number of reasons including sentencing includes including uh, parole probation supervision management. But in terms of registration, if you want a standalone system for registration, do you want to utilize the risk assessment for one, the determination of whether the person is visible on the internet website, or do you want to make it determine if the person's duration of registration could be lessened depending on the risk, or do you want it to determine if there are any additional residence restrictions or housing or employment restrictions? You know, what all do you want your risk assessment scheme to do? I want it to do all of the above, sir. Well, uh, I and NARS will fully support that goal, but however, there are significant issues to be resolved. Are, are we to assume that every individual would be satisfied with his or her risk assessment? I'm confident that that's not going to be a true thing. Uh, and also, uh, just for the record, we cannot assume that most non-contact offenders will be rated as low risk, as which they believe that they will be because that's not all at all what happens in those states that utilize risk assessments. This case is a prime example of that. Uh, so in addition, there are some other important questions and, uh, that I would need answers from the advocates who, who advocate for risk-based registration. Number one, how would you want the registration scheme to be modified to be based on, we just discussed that a little bit. Uh, number two, uh, are, you, are you suggesting that the person not be listed on the website or do you want to reduce the registration periods based on the outcome of that. And you need to be able to answer how much would it cost to create the entity that would determine the person's risk. That entity would need some level of staffing that would include professionals to conduct the individualized evaluations. Otherwise, you're stuck with using an instrument such as the Static 99, which is what they're doing, I think, up in Oregon. Uh, would the process, what would the process of the appeal look like for the registrant uh, if they disagreed? Would it be administrative or would it be judicial? You know, that there's a different level of expertise and different level of proof and different level of cost related to those appellate processes. So a lot of unanswered questions. I'm guessing that in whatever type of appeal process, we need to know who would represent the state as they would certainly want to have a say in an individual's risk assessment. And as I think this through, though, I'm wondering who would provide legal representation for indigent registrants? How would the indigent psychologist or other ex experts be compensated so that the process would be fair? You know, Larry, even on that one, it's not like it's really a, f a the legal system is fair for people that are indigent, people that have gobs of money you'll agree that they come out with better prison terms or sentences if if you throw gobs of money at the system. So a person that's indigent, they would have a crappy appeal process on this side. That is true. And, uh, and we would we would want to look at how often that they would be reevaluated, you know, what would be the because that would add another cost depending on how frequently you did that. So those are right. all great questions. Yeah, and is, would there be some sort of, you can't go reappeal tomorrow, so there would have to be, like, you have to wait a year or something like that, and how would all of that stuff be established? How could a registrant petition to have her risk assessment be reevaluated? Do you have to then go back to an attorney and pay some 5,000 bucks to get them to file a petition for you to get reevaluated again every time you want to take another bite at the apple? Yep, great questions. Also, we must recognize that this will be an uphill battle from the beginning because states are generally moving away from risk-based models to an offense-based model to comply with the federal Adam Walsh Act. And since the enactment of the AWA, several states, including Nebraska, Wyoming, Oklahoma, and Vermont, and by the way, Vermont previously used, uh, and they still do use a risk-based model, but they scrapped part of it. Uh, they, I think if you have a victim under 18, they still put you on the internet with your photo and part of your, the, at least your, the city that you live in. 
is a posted on the internet. So it's a modified risk-based system in Vermont. So states have moved away from this because that's what the federal government has encouraged when they adopted the Adam Walsh Act was that you go to a categorical approach. So you, people are moving, most states are moving in the other direction rather than moving towards a risk-based system. Those are great points about the complexity of ris risk-based registration, but do you mind if we move on at this moment? Uh, sounds good. Let's move. Uh, all right. On appeal, Mr. D argued that the trial justice erred in accepting the decision of the superior court magistrate who had determined, one, that the board used a validated risk assessment tool for non-contact offenders in deciding his risk level, and the board used reasonable means to collect the information used in the stable 2007 risk assessment tool. Can you give us some background on this case from there? Uh, yes, it's a little bit uh, a little bit dicey, but on, on uh, April 8, 2015, Mr. D pled guilty to one count of possession of CP child porn in the United States District Court for the District of Rhode Island. The court sentenced him to a modest prison term of 12 months and one day, followed by five years of supervised release. He appears, based on that, to be a non-contact offender. So, as I was telling people, don't assume you're going to be low risk. I, can you, can you, why would it be 12 years and one day? Any insight? I can't imagine. Oh, 12 months and one day. I'm sorry, not 12 years, but 12, yeah. 12 months and one day. I would guess if I were taking a guess, it's because a, a year, uh, 12 months is perceived as un, not as serious. So maybe they wanted to get it above that level. Oh, uh, uh, okay. But, uh, but I'm not sure what, what the day would have accomplished. Okay. Okay. That, that makes, that makes reasonable sense. Okay. Um, and, I noted in the opinion that he was evaluated using a stable 2007 and the opinion states that the developers of the stable 2007 designed it to evaluate and monitor changes in risk by reviewing negative social influences, intimacy deficits, problems with self-regulation, attitudes, tolerant of sex crimes, lack of cooperation with supervision, and problems with general self-regulation. Mr. D scored four points out of 26 on the stable 2007, thereby placing him in the moderate risk category. Explain how they got to that score then. Uh, I can't because I'm not really familiar with that particular tool, but it seems to me like four out of the possible number of points is pretty low, but the report justified its recommendation based on several sources. It's, it says it considered Mr. D's stable uh, uh, 2007 score statements or any in, intentional refusal to provide statements and his institutional record. The report also contemplated police reports, probation and parole supervision information, treatment information, Mr. D's conviction, and the facts underlying the offense. They claim they took everything into consideration. <sighs> um, the report noted that the investigation leading to Mr. D's conviction uncovered that he possessed a large amount of CP of an extremely graphic nature of which you kind of hinted about. And we're not going to go into the details because they get kind of nasty. I'm not even going to read this last sentence, Larry. Specifically, the report detailed that investigation uncovered over 2,600 images and 375 videos of CP in his possession, including things I'm not going to read that are really, really bad and kind of over the top, even for the, the most, uh, I don't know, deviant among us. So that can't be good. Uh, well, no, it's not good. And like I say, he got a very modest sentence in the federal system. Uh, but there was some good in the report. It documented Mr. D's lack of any history of sexual aggression, no prior criminal record, or known history of substance abuse. And it states uh, in the report uh, that the report considered his mental health history and his PFR treatment, his familial support, his employment history, and compliance with probation. So again, they're claiming that they're considering everything. I see the complexity of what you were mentioning earlier about the risk-based process. It states uh, that the board notified Mr. D of its classification decision and informed him of his obligation to register as a level two offender. Mr. D filed a timely appeal of the board's determination before a superior court magistrate. He argued that the board, one, improperly relied on the stable 2007 in determining his risk level, and two, failed to document a factual basis for scoring his problem-solving skills. What did the magistrate do with that? Uh, well, the magistrate basically rubber-stamped that they found that Mr. D was granted a meaningful hearing 
and they affirmed the board's classification. In his decision, the magistrate noted that the board based its classification on several factors, including those listed in Mr. D's risk assessment report, his stable 2007 scores, and both the quantity and graphic nature of the images in his possession. So it seems like those that quantity weighed heavily with the uh, with the board and with the magistrate affirming the board. And I, I'm just gonna throw it out there that Mr. D did not agree with the magistrate. That is correct. And see, that goes back to my point about the cost of this. Now, remember, we already had to create a, an entity. We had to staff the entity. We had to examine this guy. We had to do all this stuff. And then he did, doesn't agree with it. And now the state of Rhode Island is having to spend additional resources to come in to give him due process because they didn't agree. Mr. D appealed the magistrate's decision to a justice of the Superior Court. And so he's already had one judicial intervention. Now he's going to a mid-level appeal. And uh, there the, uh, the justice, as they call it, conducted a de novo review of the magistrate's uh, proceedings. And, and a, a what? <laughs> a de novo. It, it's a new proceeding without being bound by previous rulings. It's basically a new bite of the apple, so to speak. So, wouldn't that be like inverted double jeopardy? <laughs> Uh, no, because you're, he's seeking a review, and it just means like when you do when you're doing an appeal, you're normally doing it on the record, and they're bound by the facts that were established. De novo means that it, you're getting a fresh bite, so there there is no precedent. That there's nothing you're bound to. Okay. To hold it so from under under you're getting a second bite at the apple. Right. All right. So this go around, Mr. D argued that the coding manual for the stable 2007 states that it should not be used to estimate recidivism rates or to assign nominal risk categories for non-contact contact offenders. Mr. D also argued that inconsistent with the coding manual, the board failed to provide an adequate factual basis for its scoring determination in the poor problem solving skills. Sounds to me like he had some good points on appeal, though. Uh, he did indeed. Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, the state didn't give up. They argued that the Stable 2007 qualifies as a valid risk assessment tool in Rhode Island and that the board permissibly uses it to determine the risk levels for non-contact offenders. The state also argued that the Stable 2007's coding manual states that it can be used for both therapeutic and counseling purposes. Additionally, the state argued that the board employs a comprehensive approach in making this determination that it can rely on factors outside of the Stable 2007. Do those arguments succeed at that level? Uh, they, they, well, I was going to say they did, but I'm not sure they did because the, uh, the trial justice, and that's not the Supreme Court, found that the PFR Registration and Community Notification Act requires the board to use a validated risk assessment tool, but does not prevent the board from considering other factors in reaching its risk uh, determination. To support her conclusion, the trial justice noted that both the act and the board's Guidelines contain mandatory language directing the board to consider both actuarial uh, test scores of, and the, like the stable 2007 and outside information. And the trial justice found the stable 2007 comprises one factor in the board's overall risk determination analysis. And as long as the test is valid for some discrete purpose, the board may rely on it. So no, it did not work. So he it, lost. It didn't work at that level. Okay, so he lost at. Uh, uh, at the lower level of appeal, did he make the same arguments to the state level Supreme Court? Uh, he did. He did indeed. Uh, he didn't give up. Mr. D argued <laughs> that the trial justice, which was the middle level, uh, erred in finding that the state presented a prima facie case sufficient to justify the board's determination that he poses a, a level two or moderate risk to reoffend. Because one, he argued, the uh, uh, stable 2007 does not qualify as a validated risk assessment tool uh, for, for exclusively non-contact offenders. And two, the board did not use reasonable means to, co to collect the information used in the two, stable 2007. We've discussed this before, and I know you've told me, but you know, I'm not really the brightest bulb in the drawer, in the brightest bulb in the drawer, the sharpest knife on the tree. You, you know what I'm saying? Uh, what does prima facie mean? Well, it's one of those Latin terms that it means it's sufficient to establish a fact unless questioned. An example would be if a muffler is dragging on the pavement underneath your car and there's a car following you and the video 
picks up that, that your muffler is sparking and you're passing a tinder box of a forest and at night's a blaze, that would be a prima facie showing that you were in, in fact negligent and it would potentially set you up for some uh, monetary expenditures to reforest that land. So you'd have to come in and rebut that because I've got a prima facie showing that the forest caught a fire 35 seconds after your muffler threw sparks in the forest. Did they find his arguments more compelling than the lower level court did? Uh, they did, but I prefer to you to read it because you're a much better reader. So I, on page eight, I think it's where you would start. This is like 700 words, Larry. All right, hang on. <clears throat> on well, you can read eight, it from right here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm just kidding. On page eight, they stated, our examination of the record is the case reveals that the evidence presented by the state was not sufficient to support the board's moderate risk classification. Not only does the stable 2007's coding manual disclose that it is not a validated risk assessment tool for non-contact offenders, but it also is not clear from the record that the means used to collect and score Mr. D's problem solving skills were not reasonable in light of the guidance provided in the coding manual. That's, that's pretty good. And the, and the court also stated this conclusory explanatory note parrots the language of the scoring rubric without providing a factual basis for addition, for, for the additional point allocated. They went on to say there is nothing stated to support a finding that the board engaged in any dialogue with Mr. D about he about how he has identified past problems, generated and analyzed possible solutions, chosen his course of action, and reviewed outcomes in decision making. I mean, they didn't bother to ask him. They just conclusively came up with that idea. There is also nothing to suggest what was what his poorly considered decisions were, or how the board decided that he is whether he's open to correction. Let's uh, wrap things up here soon. I have a, a question or two when we're done, though. But the conclusion states that the trial justice erred in upholding the magistrate's decision that affirmed the board's classification of Mr. D at a level two risk to reoffend. The determination that the evidence in the record justifies the proposed level of and manner of notification was clearly erroneous. It overlooks the plain language of the stable 2007 coding manual, both with regard to its limitations or use with non-contact offenders, as well as its guidance concerning the collection of information relevant to assessing and scoring an individual's problem-solving skills. So what happens next? Do they appeal to the Supreme Court? I don't believe so because I can't see what the federal issue would be, which means that this is this decision is final. And so that that's it. He's at the state level of Rhode Island and he can't appeal to Vermont or like one of the um, circuit courts. Nothing like that. Yeah, there's no federal issue that I can see. Um, so what is the practical impact for Mr. D then? Well, then he gets a new evaluation because they can't use that instrument. So he, he, it could be that he gets the same outcome. It could be that he gets uh, found at a lower risk. But the worst case scenario would be that they could come back with a higher risk. And now that would be funny. <laughs> I don't think that that would be funny. Can this help, case help anybody else, even in Rhode Island or in other states? I would say definitely in Rhode Island. I'm not so sure it would help anybody else in another state because it's not binding. But in Rhode Island, anyone who has a non-contact offense, and if their evaluation was based on this particular tool, this what was the name of it? It's the Stable 2007. Stable 2007. I would say that they can, their, their cases are ripe for reopening based on this decision. So I would say it's a good time to be a lawyer in Rhode Island because <laughs> if... If people who have non-contact offenses have been evaluated at a higher level than the lowest possible level, and they have the resources, I would say it's time to go see an attorney and see if you can get your risk uh, level lowered. So yes, but as far as outside the state, the state you would have to cite this as as a persuasive authority, and you'd have to use it in a state that has a similar system. And that state would have had to use the stable 2007. So there's just, it's just not really all that compelling if you're not in Rhode Island. Which would lead me almost directly to that next question is of the 261 previous episodes, I don't think we've ever said the word stable 2007. I'm assuming that this is whatever stable means is then also the 2007 version. 
I would guess. I didn't do that research. I haven't worked on a case where that's been an instrument that's been used. When we get the psychosexual reports, the evaluator will give a list of what what test and what instrumentation they used. And if they if uh, if I think back, I don't remember this one ever being listed, so I'm not even familiar enough to to be helpful. But that, I mean, that's my point, though, is that it's uh, uh, obscure. Even so, I mean, maybe Rhode Island is the only batch of people that are using this whatever it is maybe it's great maybe it's not well it's certainly not great for non-contact offenders because <laughs> the developers of the test said don't use it for non-contact uh, offenders Fair enough so you would think that they would know what they designed it to do and they didn't design it to deal with non-contact offenders circle back then that we keep talking about his problem solving skills is, is he a genius or is he slow uh, that was a little unclear in terms of what was in the court decision, but I think that what they would be looking for would be your problem-solving skills when you're faced with uh, an option range of decisions. How do you analyze those options, and are you capable, and do you often make the best decision, or do you not make a good decision? Because if you're not capable of making good decisions among your options, you might not make good decisions in terms of in the community because you're going to be faced with temptation when you're in the community, right? You, Most you're not likely. Going become, you're not going to become asexual just because you've been convicted of a PFR offense. Right. So therefore, and, we, we would want you to be able to make good decisions. And that, would, that was going to be, uh, how does that even matter? It, <laughs> I don't know. I, I was going to make a comment about him having all of those videos where he might not have had interest in them. When you end, like if you start downloading pirated movies, you just start collecting movies so that you have something to trade for something else. And so if you have this particular interest, you collect other things so that you can then trade what someone else is interested in for what you're interested in. I'm not justifying or trying to say that what he did was right, but when you have all of the Marvel movies and you want to get something else and someone wants the Marvel movies and they have what you want, then you have currency to exchange. That's all I'm trying to say. Do that make sense? It makes sense, but I wasn't aware that it was traded like a commodity. So, so absolutely it straight up, a person says, what are you into, man? I yes. like to see teenage, teenage athletes. Oh, well, I've got a whole stack of those. Let me shoot them Correct. to you. What do you got? Is that the way yeah. that works? Yes. Okie dokie. There you go. Uh, I think that closes out all the questions that I did have. Are you a first-time listener of Registry Matters? Well, then make us a part of your daily routine and subscribe today. Just search for Registry Matters through your favorite podcast app, Hit the subscribe button and you're off to the races. You can now enjoy hours of sarcasm and snark from Andy and Larry on a weekly basis. Oh, and there's some excellent information thrown in there too. Subscribing also encourages others of you people to get on the bandwagon and become regular Registry Matters listeners. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to Registry Matters right now. Help us keep fighting and continue to say F-Y-P. Shall we move along to Clayton County? Clayton County, let's do it. All right. So uh, do you want to set it up or do you want me to just fire up the video? Well, we have a short video from, from an Atlanta area. We're talking about Clayton County, Georgia, by the way. And you seem to be obsessed about Clayton County. We talked about the Clayton County Sheriff just recently about his soon-to-be trip to federal prison. And now we're talking about Clayton County again. But the uh, there was a deputy that works in the Clayton County Jail that was arrested. And we're going to kind of dive into what the reaction of the county is, both on the prosecutorial side, what the citizens are saying, and what I and Arsel feel about this particular case and incident it's a, a a skosh over two minutes and uh so here's a little video for you developing story she went from overseeing inmates to being one of them after investigators say she engaged in sex acts with an inmate. Channel 2's Tom Jones is live right now in Clayton County. And Tom, the corrections officer, is out on bond. 
Uh, yes, she is, uh, Linda, and I reached her by phone briefly, but she is not ready to talk to the media as evidenced by the fact that once she found out who I was, the call suddenly ended. I spoke to people here in the county. Uh, they say if these allegations are true, law enforcement did the right thing by locking her up. Oh, yeah, she should have been arrested. They should, they need to leave her in there. Strong reactions from people who learned a Clayton County Corrections officer was arrested after investigators say she engaged in sex acts with an inmate. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. 21-year-old Mary Moore faces sexual assault by a law enforcement employee. Investigators say she and the inmate were involved in sex acts in the control tower doorway in one of the housing units. The control tower sits in the center of the housing unit. I wanted to get more side of the story. So I called her. Hello, Ms. Moore. She asked who was on the line. This is Tom Jones from Channel 2. I wanted to get your side about your, the story about your arrest. Did you do what they said you did? <laughs> The phone call suddenly ended. Uh, so, um, so this is Mary Moore of Clayton County, Georgia. And this is, she was 21 years old in September of 2022. That is surely really young to be a corrections officer. But I, you know, I've seen signs driving around Georgia. Like all you have to do is have a pulse and be 18 and you could be a corrections officer. And they tout all the perks and benefits of being an officer and uh, a security specialist in the county jail responsible for assuring that jail detainees were secured uh, and that is what she was so in late september she was arrested and jailed for inappropriate relations with an inmate and there's nothing to suggest or even hint at force the encounter was caught on video and she confessed she was later charged with sexual assault and is out on bond reaction to this was swift and condemning that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous, said one. Doing something stupid. She should have been arrested. They need to leave her in there. Inappropriate behavior. What do you have to say about this, sir? Well, I would agree. It's ridiculous, but it may be even stupid. Inappropriate behavior, yes. But the question is, what is an appropriate response? Should she be fired? Yes. Should she lose her law, lose her law enforcement officer certification? Yes, of course. Should she be charged with sexual assault? I don't think so. Should she go to prison and be left in there? I don't think so. So what will all this accomplish? Obviously, the state will go costly legal proceedings. She will certainly be found guilty, most likely through a plea deal that could give her some prison time, more cost to Georgia taxpayers, and earn her a place on the Georgia PFR registry and a coveted slot on the female side of things where there's like, I don't know, one out of a hundred, basically this will assure her a lifetime of struggle with even basic needs and of diminishing earnings, all of which predict possible dependency upon state services. Wouldn't the team red people be vehemently against this sort of thing? Well, they generally claim that, that they are, but you know, this is happening in a state that pr prides itself in its fiscal responsibility. But beyond that, in my opinion, all this, all this is over the top. All that needs to be accomplished and can be accomplished is she should no longer be in a position to misuse her position as a corrections officer. Clearly, the temptation is greater than she was able to withstand. And I'm taking her confession at face value. They say that she confessed. They say it's on video. But this could be accomplished, and she, would, she could be denied by the state of Georgia to be credentialed again at capacity. And that would be an appropriate and a measured response to what she did. I just don't know, know what we get out of locking people up and ruining their earnings capacity so that they can pay taxes into the system and support their families. I just don't get it. There you go again as a liberal pointy headed do-gooder. She needs to be held accountable and the book thrown at her, keys thrown away, buried under the jail, all that. Well, nobody disagrees that she would need to be held accountable. And I think she is being held accountable. Uh, I said similar things about uh, Sheriff Hill when he was found guilty of the civil rights violations. He's going to be serving some time in the federal prison. He's going to be very lonely in isolation because of his security needs, and he's has been held accountable. And the fact of the matter is, a 21-year-old, she's been disgraced. She's been obviously fired or in the process of being fired. She's been humiliated in the news. and 
she's what more did, what is it why is it that people are so demanding of of perpetual punishment i i have my answer but i'm i'm going to hold that one on my own for the time being i'll bite my tongue uh the case against her is uh, quite compelling apparently there's a video of the encounter i mean there's cameras like everywhere in jails these days so i'm sure they had 15 different angles of what whatever was going on well, if that is true, and I'm sure it is, the video does demonstrate that there was consensual activity between adults. Stupid, yes, ridiculous, and clearly inappropriate. But my position is to charge her with a sexual crime to destroy her future is an emotional response, an over-the-top and unnecessary, and a very costly emotional response. You people down in Georgia say that you are very frugal with your expenditures of public resources. Well, show that frugality by not throwing everybody in jail why do you have like the fifth highest incarceration rate in the entire nation is it fifth i thought it was third it's like california well, it's in, texas and then georgia i think no i'm not talking about total number i'm talking about the rate of incarceration like per capita as measured as a measured by a uh, number of people in prison by a hundred thousand population gotcha okay uh, well, this has become the norm for uh, sexual activity that is inappropriate or offensive to the public Hasn't this, that that's, it seems to be like, that's what this has become, right? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, examples would be teens sexing each other. They're charged with distributing child pornography rather than being mandated treatment and, uh, and the dangers of, of engaging in such behavior. Men found guilty of serious sexual crimes are given sentences that are measured in hundreds of years to set an example. You can't serve, very few people are able to serve more than a hundred years in prison. Right. And uh, so that's over the top. And uh, and adults having consensual sex with other adults in inappropriate situations are treated as violent sexual criminals. That's over the top. If you're running a, a 7-Eleven store and you're supervising people, it's not appropriate for you to have sex with a consenting subordinate if you're the manager of the 7-Eleven. But if it's consensual, again, I don't think that it's appropriate to make that person a leper for the rest of their life and unemployable for the rest of their life. These are emotional responses, and they're driven by our distaste for the behavior and our sense of indignation and disgust. Well, what do you what do you propose that they would have done instead? Well, I think the punishment would would be appropriate, as I described above. She would uh, you would decredential her, take her law enforcement certification. You would hit her with the most minimal. Uh, charge that you could come up with and clearly that would be a probated sentence and a misdemeanor charge would probably be more appropriate for what happened this emotional re response of we're going to lock them up because they know better yes she knew better i'm sure that there was some employment handbook in the sheriff's department i'm guessing that said that you don't have any contact intimate particular but even any outside or contact with inmates i'm sure she was uh, provided some orientation of that but she failed she, she's a 21 year old she failed, and she was tempted, and so we ruin her. We ruin her life for one mistake, really. Do you want to hear like a plausible flip side of that scenario? Forget that she had the power. Could be that the inmate had the power, and people in Clayton County generally live in Clayton County, and she probably lives at least, if not in Clayton County, somewhere in the nearby area. And there could be some sort of not i don't want to say blackmail but some kind of pressure applied that if she doesn't do the things then uh she has problems on the outside are you saying that the inmate that was uh participating in the sex blackmailed her to do the sex per perhaps i'm just some something of a plausible alternate scenario is that he, the inmate applied the pressure and not the power differential of the officer towards the inmate it's totally plausible well, I did see other videos. That was the shortest one, but I saw other videos where there was a man who had served time in the Clayton County Jail, and he said it's not unheard of. He had seen similar things before, but he said that the men that do these favors are getting favors in return in terms of uh, special treatment, protection, oh, yeah. extra privileges, and whatnot. And, and uh, so there's a quid pro quo taking place. And then some dis people I discuss this with say, well, there's a power mismatch. There's a power mismatch in every aspect of our life. I mean, there really is. You, you, 
everything you do in life, someone has more power than you. So this will be the episode where I keep hijacking conversations. Uh, someone sent me a text message saying that the, of all the time that they've ever seen someone get, they saw somebody got 3,000 years. 3,000 years. Well, he deserves <laughs> it. We'll, we'll, we'll let him out. <laughs> all right. Well, then we will move over to <laughs> the Oklahoma legislative process. <laughs> Uh, legislation moving in Oklahoma that would prevent PFR's human traffickers from working in senior living communities, because this is a very, very big problem, I'm sure. Last week, the Oklahoma Senate approved Senate Bill 369. Is it coincidental or ironic that there's a 69 in that number to prohibit long term care facilities from employing anyone listed on the state's juvenile PFR registry? The bill applies to assisted living communities, residential care homes, continuing care retirement and life plan communities, nursing facilities, home health settings, and adult day centers. Now, what's the problem with this? Well, the juvenile sex offender registry is theoretically closed in Oklahoma to the public, and the bill would grant long-term care facilities access to that registry to further vet prospective employees. It also would decrease the time period from seven to five years that nurse aides would be precluded, which is a good thing. It would decrease that period to five years that they'd be precluded from employment at long-term care facilities for any nonviolent offense. Now, the question is what all do they consider nonviolent? According to the sponsor, this legislation closes an extremely dangerous loophole that has allowed those who were convicted of sexual crimes as minors to be hired and work with our most vulnerable adults in long-term care centers, many who are physically or mentally unable to protect themselves. Who said that? That would be State Senator Jessica Garvin, who's a Republican from Duncan. She's quoted as saying that. In addition, she was quoted as saying, we must make sure our long-term care facilities know exactly who is applying and being able to thoroughly check their criminal records and backgrounds while also providing them with legal protection by putting this in the statute. Wouldn't that defeat the whole purpose of having the juvenile records being closed? Well, I don't know if I'd go that far. It would certainly weaken part of it, but uh, it, it begins to slide down the slippery slope of who all would have access to those records. That's a great point. The article also states, in many states, long-term care employers are able to look back two or three years on a nonviolent offender's record during a background search. Oklahoma employers must wait seven years after a sentence ends to hire nonviolent offenders. Care providers of Oklahoma said that it will be, a mon will be monitoring the bill as it progresses through the legislation. Who is pushing this legislation, though, Larry? Not sure, but it looks like the Care Providers Association of Oklahoma is actually pushing it because their president, Stephen Buck, is quoted as saying, Senate Bill 369 provides meaningful clarification of who can care for our state's most vulnerable residents. So that quote seems to suggest that the care providers of Oklahoma are involved in this. But I can assure you one thing, and the reason why I put this in here is because one of our loyal supporters said this bill doesn't do anything. And I told the supporter, I said, well, it does something. It, you just don't agree with it. It absolutely does do something. It it does something you don't agree with. But I'm guessing from this quote that it was the uh, caregivers themselves who said, wait, you know, we, we're having some difficulty in knowing who we're putting in these facilities without this additional access to information. And that's my guess. But since I did not have direct contact with the sponsor, the best way to find out is to contact Jessica Garvin or if there are any co-sponsors and ask them, who, who brought this to you, they'll generally tell you. Because didn't, she didn't stay awake one night burning the midnight oil trying to figure this out. No, she didn't. It was brought to her by some entity or some group that said we need to close a loophole. That's why they refer to it as a loophole. I do have a question for you. Uh, there, It was quoted as saying, uh, we, who can care for our state's most vulnerable residents. Now, I got to know, are the older people the most vulnerable or the youngest among us the most vulnerable? Which one is it? You can't have them both. Well, I would say that the older people, as they're in the final throes of their lives, they would probably be more vulnerable in terms of, of abuse. But it's a toss-up. It really is. But I'm not sure I follow your point because these are people I'm, who 
committed crimes as young people themselves. I, I know I'm I'm being silly just because we make all the PFR laws to protect our most vulnerable. Generally, you know, if it saves one child, that's normally where this goes. So now here's somebody else throwing this on the other side of the equation of making it go after uh, the, the oldest of the peoples. So that's all. well, it's in the House of Representatives now. And uh, my prediction would be that it would pass. I, I can't imagine that there would be a sufficient level of opposition that would materialize that would derail right. this. Um, it's it's uh, something that you have a hard time coming up with a viable argument against. And and someone in chat, I I just I, I have to re I, I got to reword this, but I want to share it. It says I find this mystifying. Do they think someone on the juvenile registry might um do something inappropriate with someone's grandma? It's an overbroad assumption. I don't know that I could agree with that. I, the person on the juvenile registry, we don't know what they did. We can't they, assume that automatically that they had a juvenile-related offense. They could have perved on an old person. We don't know that, do we? <laughs> you use the P word. <laughs> it cracks me up. All right, well, let's move along to this one article. I think we have enough time to do this one thing from the Associated Press. Georgia bill to require bail for more crimes fails to pass. The Georgia House voted 95 to 81. That's a fairly close split, though. On Wednesday to pass Senate Bill 63, which would have required cash or property bail for 31 additional crimes, including some misdemeanors. But the House and Senate could not agree on a final version, and the measure failed to pass as the 2023 session ended just after midnight Thursday. What does this mean? And what does it mean when it says that they could not agree? Well, what it meant is that it was one of those bills where there were changes made in one side of the rotunda versus the other. So the bill has to pass identically. And if it doesn't, then you go to a conference process that it means that the amendments cannot be worked out in the remaining moments of the session. And that's all it means. The scary thing is that Georgia's moving in the wrong direction, especially if you believe in criminal justice reform. Could could you remind me of this word? Is it's like congru, congru What's the C word when they agree? Well, if you have if you have legislation that's not identical, the first thing you do is you seek concurrence. Concurrence. That's so, the word I was looking for. But if concurrence is concurrence is not achievable. You can send something back to the originating chamber and say, look, the House say it's a Senate bill. This three, three Senate Bill 369, for example, uh, in Oklahoma. But this uh, bill in Georgia, it was a Senate bill. So the House made changes. And then the first step is to send it back to the Senate and say, would you like to concur with the House amendments? And if they say yes, it's done. But if they say no, then you have to send it back to the House and you have to send it back to the originating uh, where the amendments were and ask, would they like to recede on the amendments? And if they say no, then you have to appoint a conference committee to work out. And that requires the appointment of the members an equal quantity. And they work out an agreement among the, the conferees. And then they take that agreement back to the floor for a vote. And there just wasn't enough time. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that this bill doesn't have support. But it just means oh, I'm with you. Work out the work, so. I, I just couldn't remember the, the word. But I mean, that's a fairly close vote, 95 to 81. Well, it, it clearly it passed the, uh, the Senate. The Senate in Georgia is controlled by the Republicans. So there was nothing sure. the Democrat Party could do about it. It probably would have passed in, in, in its final to totality had there been enough time to work out a conference agreement. It would have gone back and, and it would have been agreed to it. They're just, it this is just the clock killed it is all. I gotcha. Supporters said that the bail is needed to guarantee people show back up for trial and to respect victims. This measure establishes Georgia as a state that won't accept the soft on crime policies that we've seen in places like New York, California, Illinois, and or catch and release, said representative of Houston, uh, Houston Gaines, an Athens Republican. So, yes, and mostly Democratic opponents. Uh, of, it was mostly from the Democratic side. They said many poor people would, st would sit in jail, causing them to lose their jobs, housing, and custody of their children, while costing taxpayers much more money to fund their jailing. This, the quote here is, this bill will harm poor people. This bill will create a two-tiered criminal uh, legal system in Georgia, one for those who can afford bond and one for those who cannot set house Democratic Whip Sam Park of Lawrenceville. Lawrenceville is a, now a fairly moderate to liberal suburb of Atlanta. 
and we cannot simply look uh, lock poor people up as a solution to building safer communities, concluded Representative Sam Park. Um, I also noticed that in the article it said that uh, Representative Ann Allen Westbrook, a Savannah Democrat, noted that it costs seventy-five, $74.51 a day to house a prisoner in the Chatham County Jail. Does this argument not have merit? Well, it, it should have merit, but it doesn't have merit when you really don't mean what you say you believe in, when you claim you're being fiscally frugal and responsible. Because... Sometimes you make these arguments to people and they don't have anything else to say. So what they will come back and say, well, we have to spend whatever it takes to be safe. That's, that's their comeback. Yeah, I understand. It's a, that's, a, that's a large sum of money when, you know, not 75 bucks a day, not, you know, for one day. But when you hold somebody in there for, I don't know, two years or something while their, their trial goes through, that's a crap ton of money that gets paid for. And it's an unfunded mandate on the counties because the counties pay the cost of the jail. You only become a state prisoner after you're convicted. You become the responsibility right. of the state. Now, at that point, the county starts getting paid. Most counties get paid by the state yes. at the point they're convicted. And then the state is uh, paying for their incarceration, even if they're still sitting in county jail. And, and I honestly don't know what the state is, but when I first started doing my time, they were 105% capacity, if I'm not mistaken, the state was. So uh, that doesn't bode well for the, the counties when they do need to, when they've convicted the people and they need to offload them back up to the state. There's no place to put them. So then that gets outsourced. I got outsourced to a private like county jail, so to speak, that was pretty far south in the state and spent two months there. And they were charging like 90 bucks a day or something like that. I heard them say in a, in a conversation while I was moving between vans or whatever. Yeah, well, remember fiscal responsibility. You need to bring that argument back to the people that claim that they are fiscal responsible individuals. You need to bring that argument back to them and force them to discuss it with you because sure. they claim that this is their mantra. You know, we're watching the public purse with a great deal of vigor and we're guarding every dollar of the taxpayer's money. Hold them accountable for that. Ask them, does everybody who's arrested for a crime pose such a threat to the community that we need to be incarcerating them pre-trial? Uh, well, I asked chat if they had any questions. Nobody said anything. Anything else before we uh, shut this party down? I think we've done a great job. This was fun tonight. It was a good episode. I enjoyed it. Hey, um, I have a, how's your sleep been lately? Not all that fantastic. I, uh, I, I have sent you something multiple times that offers you some different supplements or whatever. Did you ever, you, you did the melatonin, right? Yeah, I do that. Yes. And did you ever do the other drug? And I don't want to call it a drug. It's a supplement. What is it uh, called again? It's called niacinamide. What was that? <laughs> Ni niacinamide. And don't even start talking about the oleomide either. All right. Uh, that, that was just some silliness. But it's really, you should try it. It works. It knocks me out like nothing. But I'm a lightweight. I need to try it because I really would like a little more sleep. It doesn't everybody. Well, you can sleep when you're dead. I'm actually wearing a, a shirt that says nobody, nobody asks for more, whatever. They, they would like to party. I'm wearing a pirate shirt and says, hey, we need a party. We can, we can sleep when we're dead. Sounds good to me. All right, man. I hope you have a great night and I will talk to you soon. Good night. You've been listening to F Y P.